Let's talk about Edith Stein more because I don't yeah. know a lot about her. I know a little bit about what she has to say about empathy, which my under- if my understanding is correct, modern neuroscience is now validating. Did yeah. you ever get into that with mirror neurons and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I haven't gotten into it in a scholarly way, mm. but I am aware of the neurological research that's showing her her concept of empathy is being confirmed mm-hmm. by neuroscience and is also helping some neuroscientists to develop their their yeah. neurology of, of empathy. You'd know more about it than me, yeah. but we'll talk about that in a second. But first of all, who was Edith Stein? I'd love, I know yeah. you're a, so, yeah, a yeah. devotee of hers. So. Yeah, so um, a German Jewess born in the 19th century to a, an Orthodox Jewish family. Her father died le- shortly after her birth and her mother took over the lumber business they had and, and ran it successfully afterwards. She was the last of 11 children. And as a child, she was incredibly precocious, very gifted in many areas, particularly in uh, learning. So her early schooling was was uh, an easy task for her. In her teenage years, she experienced at least agnosticism, if not atheism, and began and stopped stopped praying. And so in some way, inwardly distanced herself from the practice of the Jewish faith, mm-hmm. though she continued to go to synagogue with her with her mother and continued to perform the outward observances. When she was um, in her early 20s, she went to university. Now in German, in Germany of her day, it was only recent that women were allowed to attend university. So she would have been in the first couple of generations of women attending German universities. And she studied, um, I've forgotten now, but she did a defined interest in psychology as well. Mm-hmm. Through that, she came across the logical investigations of Husserl and there discovered um, what she was searching in her search for the truth of reality. Through phenomenology, she began to approach questions of faith again, because phenomenology takes all questions without a priori resolution. I'll approach everything mm-hmm. and think through it. And so phenomenology opens the way to thinking about angels as possible or God as possible and thinking about them. And then also she had many personal experiences of people with faith and began to move toward the Christian Catholic faith. Mm. In January 1st, 1922, she was baptized and immediately wished to enter the Carmelite order. But she had, I suppose, a public persona to some degree as a philosopher who studied under his Mm. And so she was recommended by her spiritual advisor to to stay in the world. And so she taught at a Dominican school for a number of years. Mm. Eventually, she taught at a Catholic pedagogical institute and had to give up her position there because uh, the Nazi regime had risen to, risen to power in Germany. And so she f- was finally released to enter the Carmel and she entered the Carmelite order in Cologne in 1934, I think, 1933-34. And the name she took? She took Theresia Benedicta Acruce, Teresa Blessed of the Cross or Blessed mm. by the Cross. And so she did a devotion, devotion to Teresa of Avila. She read her work her autobiography, and this was a, a vivid moment of her conversion. And uh, she was also in some way devoted to St. John of the Cross and recognized in suffering and the Christian answer to the question of suffering, something of defined import. And interestingly, she was born on the feast of Yom Kippur, mm. which is the Jewish day of mercy, their holiest day. And her mother at least thought that this in a way marked the course of Stein's, Stein's life. It begins to show up then in her own life and her own sufferings. And eventually she's martyred. She's taken from the Carmelite convent because the Catholic bishops in Holland published a pastor letter against Nazi socialism. She'd moved from Cologne to to Echt in Holland prior to this. And she was transported to Auschwitz and was gassed on August 9th, 1942. Mm. So she was a contemporary of Husserl. Yeah. And was his secretary. Yeah. How did she come into contact with him? And maybe you've already addressed this, but what was it specifically about his work that captured her? So, yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I just, she was studying German and history at university, but she did find interest in psychology and was going to do further studies in psychology. But the discipline of psychology was only a newly developed discipline at mm. the time. This was early 20th century. And during the course of her psychological studies, she, she read the second volume of Logical Investigations. And there she discovered the answer to her psychological questions and then also undergirding philosophical questions. So she moved from her home city, University, Breslau, now modern day 
uh, Wroclaw. It's a Polish city today, but I can't mm. pronounce it correctly. And moved to the university at which Husserl was teaching, Göttingen. Mm. And there she did doctoral studies under him on the problem of empathy mm. and later became his secretary, collating his writings and, excuse me, mm -hmm. and um, preparing them for publication and also teaching new students phenomenology. Husserl was a great thinker, but he wasn't um, easy to understand as a, as a student. So many of his uh, early uh, students like Stein and Adolf Reinach would have taught introductory classes in phenomenology so that students could then enter into the Husserlian way of understanding philosophy. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe or you're a dingus. What's a dingus exactly? Used to refer to something one cannot or does not wish to name specifically. <laughs> you don't have to subscribe, but if you did, I'd love it. You dingus. Like the video. <laughs> That's who we're using that one. Take one.